absolutely need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jai Paul Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. And good morning. This is Dave Debo. Coming up later on the program today, we'll talk with Leah Watson. She's an attorney with the ACLU Nationwide. They've done some interesting studies looking at censorship in schools, specifically some of the things that are in place in other places that have kept other districts from talking about the situation that happened in Buffalo on May 14th and other race-related issues. It's an emerging topic that we will get to in about half an hour here. But first... Let's bring in Catherine Fisher Collins. She's the regent representing Western New York on the New York State Board of Regents. She's basically the uh, one of the people on the statewide school board, as it were. She's written about 13 books, including Black Girls and Adolescents Facing the Challenges, Sources of Stress and Relief for African American Women. She's written about the imprisonment of African American women, causes, and many others. Uh, she's a nurse. She has a keen background in health issues. She's an adjunct professor at Niagara University, uh, formerly an associate professor at SUNY Empire State College. Regent Collins, thanks so very much for being with us this morning. You're welcome, and thank you for the invitation. I, I'm glad you're here, and I think uh, to set up maybe our, our discussion for the second part of the program today, I wanted to touch briefly on what is mandated. Does the State Board of Regents require a certain amount of education about racial issues? There's no set number of hours that we uh, have decided that we should talk about racial issues. No, there's no set hours. Uh, if it occurs, uh, it occurs as part of the curriculum, which you know the districts have that responsibility for. Is that enough? Uh, do you see any change or something coming down the pike where, in light of instances like what happened at Tops, that the board could, and I know you speak for yourself, not the entire board, but that the board could perhaps um, mandate a change or an increase in the amount of discussion that is held around racial issues? Well, we do discuss inclusion, and, and that means that you bring in other people other than just African Americans or Latinas. Uh, so there is a way that it is discussed, but not, uh, you know, Lesson 102 will talk about African-American people today. No. Okay. Is that enough? Would you, uh, would you be interested in a change? Well, um, I think that we have to approach it in such a way that it is integrated in the curriculum. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> So it makes sense. It's not just, let's talk about race. If we're going to talk about race, let's talk about the contributions of individuals who happen to be African American or happen to be Latino or other ethnic groups. Not that it's um, a, a set, um, let's talk about race. Let's integrate it so people can include it in their thought process. Not that today we're going to talk about uh, someone who has um, done something tremendous to impact, like Mr. D uh, Dr. Drew, who dis decided that uh, blood products was needed, developed them, and then, unfortunately, when he needed to have a blood transfusion, was refused to give some th the blood that he needed and as a result died. You're talking about so, Char Charles Drew, for whom yes, a, a local yes. magnet school is named. Yes, yes. So make it relevant to something that you know that you incorporate every day, just like um, Mr. Chip, who was uh, uh, the, the gentleman, the African-American gentleman who um, inventor who invented the potato chip. 
Now, when you eat a potato chip, a uh, black man, he was the one who, um, you know, designed that, thought of it, and now it's part of our food group. So it means something to you, not that we're just talking about a black man who invented the way to use blood products or to have a potato chip. It means something to you. It's incorporated into your daily thought process, something that doesn't come and go, something that means something to you and your family and your community. Buffalo has certainly done a lot with uh, what they call uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate curriculum. Obviously, in a district that has a lot of minority students, those kind of stories are more important because children need to see the inspiration that comes from them. Talk for a minute what this would mean at uh, a district in Arcade or a more rural area where there isn't necessarily a minority student population. Well, you can still incorporate the um, uh, the information into the discussion. Uh, we have a national holiday um, that comes every year and schools are closed and therefore <coughs> leading up <coughs> excuse me leading up to that um holiday you could talk about um uh, the contributions of african americans or leading up to any of the other holidays that represents various ethnic groups you could begin to incorporate that regardless of where you live you you're not stuck in that community you do leave and go elsewhere and you do see african american people and you see latinas and you see others so you could say that we're going to discuss um um the holiday that's coming up and it's related to this particular african american group and we think that it's important for you to know about it because when you get on the bus, you may see um, uh, a side panel that talks about it. And when you're out uh, with your family um, on vacation, we want you to understand the significance of um, Broderick Park that crosses the Niagara River where African slaves went across. So, and it leads over to the Niagara River, one of the fastest rivers in the country. It leads over to Niagara Falls. It leads over to another whole country where a whole group of people left and went to another country in order to have some sense of freedom. Dr. Catherine Fisher Collins is with us. She is the regent representing West New York on the New York State Board of Regents. Talk a little bit about May 14th with me. Where were you? What uh, reaction did you have when you first heard? Well, I was very uh, concerned about it because the two days before I was standing in front of the store uh, thinking about going in and purchasing something because even though I don't live in that community, I always support those stores in that community, especially that one because my sister lives on that street. And my hairdresser lives on that particular street that is parallel to the store, uh, to Tops. And so I spent a lot of time over there, and, and, and one of the banks that I bank at is right across the street from that store. I heard that, and I was so devastated. I couldn't, I could hardly breathe. My nephew worked in that store. Mm. He's a teenager. And he was at one of the first counters in that store. And all I could think about was him and was he going to be one of the tragedies that come out of it. I'm so um, heartfelt because I do, did know two of the individuals and um, that they perished in that store. Uh, it just goes to show you that we do not have a real feel for communities across the country and where people are from and where they're going and the possibility of what they're going to do when they get there. It's not only just about Buffalo. It's about all of the cities in this country. Buffalo happened to put it on the map, which and it's, 
it's not a good way to be recognized because we do have so many other wonderful things that go on in Buffalo, like we're getting ready to play. <laughs> the Bills are getting ready to play. Mm. So we have so many wonderful things in Buffalo, but we don't want to put that on the map. I got so many calls calling me saying, are you okay, Catherine? What can I do for the city of Buffalo? It has raised our visibility out there, and I'm hoping it's raised because people want to help us not to, to come and hurt us again. So I'm concerned about the visibility that this has happened to us, that others don't think of not so good things to come to our city to do. If this is too personal, forgive me and I'll move on. Uh, you, you don't have to answer this next question. Is your nephew okay? My nephew is fine. Um, he is um, back at school. He's working. Um, I don't believe he went back to Tops. I'm not sure. Hmm. But his experience of hearing those gunshots, I, I think of a 15-year-old child listening to gunshots and then happened to run and hide in that store he found someone else and they hid somewhere in that store and thinking that he may die and his parents how, his, how my nephew and his wife um, felt that they're about to lose one of their children a block away from where he lives he lives within that block so it really is hard I mean, I feel so, um, I'm so grateful to God that he was not injured. But on the other side, for him to experience that, and he did have some, you know, trepidations after and some um, feelings, anxiety, stress, you know, uh, PTSD does not come right at that moment sure it can come at any time but you wonder about all those other people who if you go to that store across the street there are businesses there are people always in that area all those people who walk to that store who live in that community every time they walk by there every time i drive by there and i see those 10 faces i just my heart just goes out to those families um, and how they're going to have to live with this stress throughout their entire life. They lost the person, a uh, family cer member. Certainly the community lost elders, and you said you knew a couple people uh, who indeed were among the victims. But I want to take just a moment to talk more about youth, especially with the school uh, year starting to open this week. Uh, does Buffalo schools, because of this shooting, face a additional challenge or need to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do in a year where this didn't happen? Well, certainly these children who are coming back into our schools are aware of what happened. You can't ignore that and say, well, it happened and it's gone and these kids are okay. They're not going to always be okay when you have flashbacks of what happened in your community and why it happened, and then you try to figure out. Young people, they know things are happening in their community, but they don't want to dwell on them. You know, they're happy to return to school to see their friends and their teachers and to get on with their life and look forward to graduation playing football, doing the things that they like to do in school. They're, they're anxious to do those kind of things, and then all of a sudden you turn on the radio, you put the TV on, and you see all of these other things that's going on in our country, the floods, the fires, um, the war, and other countries that really involve us, too, in our thoughts. For those people and those young kids and people trying to cross our borders, there are so many things that, you know, we may think that it's um, okay to 
you know, turn on our televisions and radio and listen to these things. But sometimes people internalize things that they hear and see differently. We want our kids to be able to get rid of them. We don't want that stress on them. Stress can make you ill. Stress can get you thinking about things that you shouldn't be thinking about and thinking about things that you shouldn't do. In, in part, this is a perfect time then to bring up the fact that uh, the New York State Education Department about two years ago mandated mental health education in all the classes. Uh, how's that going? Uh, address uh, w what you think that has accomplished. Well, we have, and we make sure that we have. It's not only just the mental health um, professionals that we have in the schools. It's the nursing it's the nurses who are in the schools, too, that are very close to the children, are, who are helping them to manage their anxiety and their stress. It's going well because we have monies allocated towards putting more mental health uh, workers in our schools. We have um, the teachers through their um, in-service uh, training um, have had people come in and talk to them about the identification of a kid who may be having some mental issues there. And it's one thing to identify them, but where do you send them to get help? And that's the wonderful part of this whole thing, is that they can go to the, the nurse or the counselor or the, the, the uh, mental health social worker or the psychologist that we make sure that every school has some psychologist attached to it and to get them into um, a program where their family can go along with them because you know the family is so important to this piece too especially mom mom has to take on so much of the anxiety that their children are experiencing in school and she has to make sure that the kid is where it's, the child should be and at that time. And if they need to be at the counselor's office, they should make sure that they're at the counselor's office. Your, your predecessor on the Board of Regents, Robert Bennett, was a very big proponent of family support centers, places in each district where the mom, for example, to use your phrase, uh, to use your conversation as a jumping off point, the mom could go and get help that the student would otherwise get in school. But uh, basically turning schools into, I don't want to say community centers entirely because that doesn't grasp the whole concept, but a place where they can access a lot of services. Do you see the need for that even expanding now in a place like uh, Buffalo's East Side after the shootings on Jefferson? Yes, more so. More so. That community has to heal. That community has to heal. And the people who come into that community to work, how do you think they feel coming into a community that uh, is there that has lacked services for years? And now all of a sudden here we are trying to put services in a place where we knew that there was a need. I worked at Erie County Medical Center as part of my responsibility was the emergency room where people would come in for mental health services. You, you were a nurse, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. A uh, nurse practitioner. And, right. All right. And it, well, the administrator there at... Um, ECMC. ECMC, because I had all 69 clinics, was under my responsibility, including the emergency room. And in the emergency room, we had uh, Empath, which was a area for people to come in when they needed um, quick mental health services. But of course, we have many more places that people can go, but you have to get there and you have to make sure that there's follow up. We don't want you to just come in for one appointment and then go away. We want you to come in for your appointment, get your medications, and follow through on what the practitioner is telling you you need to do. Um, I think the parent, and I've said this at the Regents meeting, the family or the mom is the key to academic success and to health. 
she's the navigator in the family. She takes care of all the appointments. She's the one who has to pick up the kid from school, take the kid to the appointment. She has not only his appointments or her appointments, but her husband's appointment. And if she has more than one child, she has to take and manage all of them. So she is the role model and the person who has to think about how she's going to manage that in addition to her own work schedule because she may be working as well. So, yes, I agree with the former regent, Bennett, that there should be probably more community centers around and within our communities. However, we do have programs like Best Self and what they offer. Mm -hmm. And we have um, our, uh, what is the other one? Um, Spectrum. Crisis service. Crisis service. And Spectrum. Well, crisis service is there. You can call. And you can have, you know, talk to people there. They can refer you. And every hospital, every emergency room has contact with mental health professionals that they can refer you to if they need to. You, you spoke earlier about the needs of the community, the idea that uh, they need to heal, but also that they need resources. I want to step just a little bit away from education for a moment and, and talk to you, not necessarily as a member of the State Board of Regents, but just as someone that is in touch with the community. How do we clear that hurdle? How do we end up giving more resources back to a community that traditionally has had such a hard time getting them? And that's the travesty, have had such a hard time getting them. We have a lot of talent in Buffalo, a lot of talent. We know which communities are getting the things that they need and the things that they don't need, we also know that as well. Why has it come to this point where you and I have to talk about the fact that this community has not received its fair share? Now, I say that with a capital F, fair share of everything that is offered, not just through the city and the county, but through all these private groups out there that has uh, resources that they could have invested in our community. You look around some areas of the city and you almost see services on top of one another because there's so much. Mm. And then you go over to the east side or you go down Jefferson, and I'm a native of Buffalo. I was born and raised and educated and worked in this city all of my entire life. I've seen Buffalo at its best and now, in some places, at its worst. And I, I know the neighborhood that I lived in was a very integrated neighborhood. And that was Jefferson, Broadway, Pratt Street, all of that area. And much of it from William Street down was was just completely tore down. And there were businesses from Main Street all the way down to, um, to Jefferson. And that whole area now where there's um, housing, housing, the project, um, apartments there um, was all businesses. Why would you come into a community and tear it down and take out all the businesses? Was that just urban renewal? What, what, what changed? How did this happen? Yes, how did it happen? We had politicians sitting and making decisions and deciding on, well, let's tear this down and then the structure and let's put something else up. But it was 10 years before anything went up. So meanwhile, that community did not have those resources. We have people who are elected to look out for us that were elected when I was a kid in the Buffalo Public Schools. We did not have to have half the resources, but we had very, very responsible teachers who did more than just teach the curriculum. They loved us. 
they love I felt that all of my teachers loved me. And they and they act like they love me and my brother and my sister. The teachers were so responsible to us now then and we have to bring that same sense back into the classroom where teachers just love you. I loved all my teachers and I was they were like my minister. I helped my teacher in such high, all the teachers in the Buffalo Public School, I held them in such high esteem. They were right up there with my minister. You spoke of how in your youth the, uh, the area was much more integrated. Right now, more than 75% of the blacks in Buffalo live east of Bain Street. Yes. How do we desegregate? We uh, need to look at what available property is out there and how we can make sure that HUD and other places who have monies to invest, invest in that community. I own property in the university area and I certainly wanted to invest in the property and I did go to the city to see if there was any monies to put in a new furnace. I was always turned down because I was a nurse. I made $16 an hour. Mm -hmm. I was a nurse. <laughs> that was the, 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 the um, primary problem. I made too much money. So they would not invest in my property. I was very discouraged to see this housing unit that the city uh, was responsible for that was supposed to invest in the university area. But if you made $16, uh, $16 an hour, you were ineligible. So we need to make sure that the way that the guidelines are written, that it gives the homeowner the ability to come to the city to get low interest loans. No one's asking that you give them money free that you don't pay back, if you can pay it back. But we should have a housing division that is very pensed on various sections that they know where the housing stock is not good and where we should invest much more of our resources. We have done that with other communities. All you have to do is write the nightly news and you'll see another, another building going up somewhere where there's millions of dollars going into it, but it's not on the east side. Catherine Fisher Collins is with us. She's the regent representing Western New York on the New York State Board of Regents. I want to jump back to education just uh, as we close here. We've got about five minutes left and, and maybe Maybe this topic is much bigger than the five minutes that remain. But what is the role of education in creating more anti-racists out there? Well, we have to make sure that um, those individuals who are responsible for teaching the information really believe the information. They really support the information that they're giving to these young people and that it's fair to say that they themselves are not racist that they themselves believe in the message we want you to carry the message in such a way that you believe it and those people who are listening to you they believe it as well because you exude that I am a believer that equality means equality and fairness for all. And that I'm going to be there to support it. I mean this. This is me. I believe that we all should share in the American dream. We all should support democracy because that's where all of this comes from. It comes from democracy. Everyone should have an opportunity to participate 
in the American dream. Just look at the people at our southern borders that are trying to get into this country. They know that all the resources that we have, it's in this country. It may not be fairly distributed, but it's in this country. And they want a part of the American dream. And that's what has been lacking in the African commun- African American community, the ability to participate in the American dream. And lastly, uh, our next segment, we're going to be talking a little bit about educational censorship. The ACLU has undertaken some studies that show in other places, not around here, obviously, but in other places, there are districts across the country that have been prevented from talking about the shootings in Buffalo, that there are things happening out there that say, don't talk about race, that some of the spinoffs from critical race theory criticism has resulted in a chilling effect that percolates down through the classrooms. I'm not sure we've seen that in New York State, so I wanted to get your opinion on that, but I also wanted to hear what can be done about that sort of thing, again, more broadly nationwide. Well, nationwide, uh, we have our elections coming up. Um, I would say to people, listen to the rhetoric that's coming from all of those individuals who want to be in those roles and make sure that it's somebody you want to support. Uh, we can talk all days, but they, you know, have the the final policy um, decisions. Make sure you go to the polls and vote. Um, we are very lucky here that we do not have people that saying you can't treat, uh, teach um, critical race theory. Critical race theory, um, people miss, I think, kind of miss um, the um, intent uh, of it. And it's not to hurt anyone. What it is, it's to help people to understand that things happen in this country. And it was done by individuals who do not want us to talk about their bad behavior. And so what we do is we say, no, we can't talk about anything. But some people have done bad things. And it's called history where those bad things are recorded. And if you talk about African-American history, you'll talk about some of the bad behaviors that went on by some people. Not all people, but some people. You can look at any um, areas of the world and see that there's going to be bad people. So what do you do? You don't talk about them. Uh, The kabuki, the dance, and the productions that are done in in, uh, Japan, they tell the story of the wars and the various history activities that went on in their country. And this is done in the theater. So young people see that there were wars between people, but there's no wars now, but there's wars then. But it's not to say that we don't want you to, we don't want you to go out and start a war, but we want you to understand these are the things that led up to the wars. These are the things that you need to know as you grow into adulthood. So we do not make a mistake and do them again. We need to talk more about the war. Thank you. Dr. Catherine Fisher Collins is on the New York State Board of Regents. She represents the eight districts in the western part of uh, New York State. Dr. Collins, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Get all the trusted local news you need right to your inbox each weekday morning with the WBFO daily email. Visit WBFO.org to sign up today. WNED PBS can go everywhere you go with the WNED PBS app. 
Go to the app to watch shows like Klein Hands Gift to Buffalo, Frontline, and Compact Science. Even watch on the go with the WNED PBS live stream and a 24-7 stream of WNED PBS kids. You can also see the full television schedule and what's on right now from the app. Download the WNED PBS app wherever you get your apps. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. This is Dave Debo. We are looking a lot at education this week. And in the process, you, you heard me mention it with Dr. Collins just a bit ago, we found there are districts across the nation where teachers have been told not to discuss the Buffalo shootings. Teachers have reported a chilling effect where they felt in some cases that they could not discuss the shooting because in some places in other states there are limits on the way they can discuss race and race relations. The American Civil Liberties Union has been looking into this and studying it. Let's get into it now with Leah Watson. She's a senior staff attorney with the ACLU and their racial justice program. She focuses on bias and policing. She focuses on poverty and specifically about classroom censorship efforts. Leah, thanks for being here. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Let's define classroom censorship. What is that? Is that uh, basically groups that are in some way keeping people from talking about race? Yes, I think that that's the current iteration. You know, across the country, we've seen classroom censorship bills introduced that want to withhold education, instruction from students pertaining to racial and sex discrimination. We This has really expanded in the past two years since the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and the racial reckoning. And so now, initially, there was a discussion of expanding the sessions of anti-racism in schools, racial justice in schools, equality, culturally responsive learning. And we've seen a backlash where now those topics and even more broadly, just references to race or sex and their manifestations of society are now being prohibited from classrooms across the country. It's a different issue, obviously, but I wonder if the, the tactic is the same as the don't say gay legislation in Florida. Is it something that comes from legislation or is it something that maybe springs forth more locally from school boards and activists and that sort of thing? It happens both ways. Since 2021, we've seen about 200 classroom censorship bills introduced in over 40 states. I think we're up to 43 states. But we've also seen these classroom censorship measures occur in school boards, at the local, state, and even attempts at the federal level. What is it that they are trying to stop, and how do you react to it? So proponents of these bills would say that they are trying to stop critical race theory. Critical race theory is an academic framework that is used in higher education classrooms that looks at ways that racism is embedded in American society. Studies have shown, and also the framework is very complicated, so um, studies have shown, and just actual looking at what critical race theory is, it's not something that people are teaching in classrooms, in K-12 classrooms. It's not something that students can easily digest. But under the umbrella of critical race theory, conservatives have lumped together things that go beyond that. They are really including any references to racism, especially systemic or institutional racism, references to equality, diversity, equity, inclusion. There have been identified a list of close to 50 terms that are basically synonymous for them with race and an intentional effort to exclude these conversations. A lot of the discourse talks about critical race theory. We're talking about racism, but most of the bills that have been introduced and the laws that have been passed include references to both race and sex discrimination. They are stemming from language, cribbing from language that was included in Trump's executive order that was introduced in September 2020, Executive Order 13950, and it listed a number of prohibited concepts to not be discussed in that context in training for federal contractors, but that language has been lifted 
and expand it to include employers in Florida, but in most states is limited to education either in the K-12 and or the higher ed context. So if, if there are groups out there that are against critical race theory and they fight that battle, it sounds as if you're saying in the process, a lot of other discussion about race doesn't get to happen. Yes. I, that's something that's known as the chilling effect because people don't know what critical race theory actually means. And the, the concepts that are being included in these laws are much broader than critical race theory. They include things like, one, many of the concepts are vague and they're hard to decipher. So they'll include things like, you know, not teaching that a student is morally superior to another one because of their class or race most schools that's not happening in actual schools but there are some phrases that are a little bit broader where um concepts like colorblind or objectivity or neutrality under these under these laws you can't teach that those have racist or sexist origins even though that's something that's well documented in research and accepted widely across academic disciplines and then there are also these kind of catch-all provisions in the way that i think about it where you say a teacher can't teach information that would cause a student to feel guilt or embarrassed or sadness on account of their race or sex. To be clear, as a former teacher and someone who talks to a lot of teachers, this is information that teachers are actually teaching. Right. But the, the perception of which has a broad chilling effect and the consequences under these laws can be very sweeping. In Oklahoma, teachers can lose their teacher's license um, in the state for violating HB 1775. In Florida, schools can be stripped of that. They avoid these topics altogether. In the pro- process of um, teaching people about race, I imagine there almost needs to be a discussion of white privilege. Is this what's being prevented from brought into the classroom when you said, oh, what will make one race feel inferior? Yes, in fact, in Oklahoma, in response to the passage of HB 1775, the classroom censorship bill, one district instructed their teachers, do not say white privilege in class. Do not say that phrase at all. Other school districts have been across the country, have been instructing school districts and school administrators, have been instructing their teachers to just say, I don't know, when teachers, when students ask questions pertaining to race or to move the conversation along very quickly. Other districts and school administrators have asked teachers not to teach about social studies more than two to three minutes a day. So it has a very dire consequence. And also it has prevented discussions of current events as well. Teachers reported after the terrible shooting in Buffalo, where you are, the teachers reported that when students asked questions, they felt like they couldn't even answer questions about the shooting and the racial motivations behind the shooting because they were worried that it could be interpreted as infringing upon the prohibited concept of their classroom censorship in their state. I knew it would get there. Tell me more about those specific instances. What, uh, what was reported to you folks and what can be done there? I think what has been reported is that teachers was being reported to us, was being documented in research and what teachers are saying very freely is that they are afraid and there is a culture of fear and intimidation as a result of these classroom censorship laws. And this culture of fear and intimidation has even transcended in places where the law hasn't actually passed. If a law was introduced, they are receiving feedback from their administrators to avoid topics and they don't want to be perceived as speaking about something or saying something that's inappropriate. A lot of the text is very vaguely worded and so it's not clear from the text of the law or the or you know the school board ordinance what is or is not prohibited so we've been filing lawsuits across the country first in oklahoma we filed the first challenge to a censorship a classroom censorship bill of this sort with co-counsel at the lawyers committee Um, and we've also filed in new hampshire and most recently in florida but the fact that teachers don't know what's included, so they don't feel comfortable talking about race at all, even when their students are asking questions or asking them to, asking for text that helps them understand the perspectives of people of color, it really puts teachers in a hard place. Have any of these bills been introduced here in New York State? Is it, uh, forgive me for putting it this way, but if, is it an issue for us? 
Yes, there have been bills introduced in New York State. The last time I checked, there were two bills currently pending in New York State. And so there, it, it started, it is a conservative movement that has been perpetuated by a vocal minority, but no state is really immune to these efforts, whether at the state or local level. The last part of this discussion that I think we haven't touched on is textbooks. Is that sort of activism, is that sort of censorship underway in New York State? Or is that, again, a a problem maybe nationwide, certainly something we we need to talk about, but not necessarily something here? Yes, it has become a part of this trend to exclude, a part of the censorship has become to exclude materials from classroom instruction, but also the curriculum. And similar to the widespread nature of classroom censorship laws, we've also seen um, classroom censorship in the form of banned books in New York. So that is something I know multiple organizations, including the New York Civil Liberties Union, has initiatives around expanding access to banned books and New York City public libraries. But this is also something that has arisen in the state of New York. Leah Watson is here. She's a senior staff attorney for the ACLU's Racial Justice Program. We're talking about classroom censorship. And while on one hand, Leah, I I get everything you're saying about how in other states it's legislated, I can also picture uh, pressure on local school boards that isn't necessarily state legislation, but people standing in rooms at school board meetings saying, teach this, don't teach that. What do you know about the scope of that side of the equation? I mean, I think that the scope is similar. Sometimes there has been a manufactured hysteria around around critical race theory. I started with one person, Christopher Rufo, who went on Fox News and talked about this a few times, directing his attention towards the White House, and they called him. And he came to the White House the next day and began drafting these laws. So the focus around critical race theory has really been heightened by a few vocal minorities. Um, And there are multiple organizations that have briefing materials for people to go to their school board and to ask for, you know, classroom censorship without saying it as explicitly. So the, the requests are very similar across the board. They talk about excluding critical race theory. Sometimes the New York Times 1619 project is referenced specifically um, because it was relatively new leading into um, the racial reckoning of 2020. And there's other other discussions as well, but there's pretty consistent measures, the content of what is being sought, the content of the information that will be censored as a result of these measures is essentially the same at the school board level versus the state. It's interesting you say that because earlier this week, the New York State School Boards Association came out with a report that said nearly one third of all school board members in all of the districts in New York State declined to seek reelection in 2022. The turnover rate in other years was about 20 to 25 percent. They go on to say that COVID might be a part of it, but also that schools have become polarized, that meetings have become contentious, that many boards present uh, received all sorts of criticism from parents about pandemic-related policies, mask mandates, that sort of thing. If the populace is being energized by the COVID-related issues, is there a spillover to the racial education issues that you're talking about? Yes, I think they, they're they all intertwined. We've had a, a lot happen, honestly, in the past two years with COVID, with the racial reckoning, with the backlash from, honestly, both of those. And I, I think the conservatives have really rallied and there have been organizations that have organized parents around the notion of parents' rights and focusing on parents' rights instead of students' rights, in my opinion. But we had parents rallying against mask mandates, parents demanding that schools were open, and in the same way, those fights were happening at the school board level. And that same energy has carried over to demanding that their children are not taught certain information. We've also seen an increase in laws and bills being introduced and laws being passed in multiple states that allow 
taping of teachers in classrooms so that they are able to, so parents are able to monitor in real time what is occurring. It, there's the culture of fear and intimidation isn't limited to the teachers that are standing in the classrooms at the time. School boards have become a huge battleground and conservatives in their briefing materials are encouraging these battles to happen at the school board level, encouraging their members and sometimes even threatening school board members. There have been multiple documented occasions where school board members now have to have security and they need security because there are physical threats to their safety as well at these meetings. Is The situation can be underestimated. Is your opposition because of the tactics or because of the end result? I could see them arguing that this is our school board. We have a right to voice our opinions here and to put uh, pressure on our elected officials. If an area happens to be more conservative, that they would want their kids taught more conservative things. So the standard that the Supreme Court has set for when information can be for censoring information is that you can't censor information, withhold it from students in the K-12 context for motivation when you are motivated by political or racial purposes. So I would just apply that that here. Is the motivation here a genuine concern about the pedagogical approach that students are taking? Or is it motivated by politics? Is it motivated by racial racially discriminatory purposes. If it's one of those, I think it's inappropriate for schools and the Supreme Court agreed. I'm just following, it's, it's not a standard that I made up, it's I'm following the standard that they have set. So tell me that again, the Supreme Court has basically said that, that the adoption of a curriculum cannot become a tool of racism? Am I am I oversimplifying it there? I will, I will phrase it a little bit differently. In the K-12 context, states have control. They do have the right to control what students are learning. They issue standards to make sure students in different schools are learning the same materials across the board. They have tests to evaluate achievement of students on concepts that are deemed to be important. Those materials and that decision making is done by educators. Educators should be the ones to determine what is best for students to learn and the best way of presenting that information. The Supreme Court, recognizing the importance of educators in that process, has said that the state can't censor materials for political purposes or racial purposes. So you can't just say, well, we don't want to learn about um, we don't want to learn about racial justice because we don't believe in racism. And then, you know, censor all of those materials. It, this has come up in other contexts before, particularly well, I'm from Arkansas originally, and particularly in the creationism context mm -hmm. where, you know, students in some in some areas, people did not want their kids to learn about evolution. They only wanted to learn a creationist perspective. And so this is another place that this has come up before where you can't just censor this information altogether because you, you disagree with it. And with a court ruling behind you, this, I imagine, is where someone like the ACLU can come in. You litigate, right? I litigate. And we have brought claims. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're litigating in three states right now. Oklahoma, particularly, we have claims on behalf of students and teachers and on behalf of teachers in New Hampshire. Our case in Florida is in the higher ed context. But these are, these are issues that we bring before the courts as well. I also just wanted to flag to answer your question. My personal view is as a former teacher, we should really be thinking about what is in the best pedagogical interest of the students. What's the best pedagogical approach for engaging students? The Supreme Court has spoken repeatedly about the importance of schools for preparing kids to learn academically, but also to serve as citizens in a democratic, multi-ethnic, multi-racial society. And I think that that socialization process is an important part of this as well. So just thinking about what is going to be best for the students as the motivate the motivation um, for the pedagogical approach and really leaving that to the educators to determine how to teach their students. When it's overt legislation, you can certainly sue and try to change it after the fact. When it's less overt, when it's just pressure exerted on school boards, does someone like the ACLU have an option or do parents have an option? How does this play out when it's not, quote, unquote, illegal? 
So I think this is a very interesting question and really requires us to look on a case-by-case basis and the ways that pressure is exerted. You certainly would still continue to have constitutional rights, even if there wasn't a law. And so there might be a world in which you could frame a lawsuit um, claiming there was an infringement of your constitutional rights, even in the absence of the law. But I think you would have to, it's something that we would consider on a case-by-case basis. And honestly, that's something that we have to consider with each of these classroom censorship measures. Despite being widespread and being passed in almost half of the state, introduced in over 40 states, each measure is independently, must be independently reviewed for the scope. And so I think here we would just need to dig further into what information is being excluded, what reasons or evidence do we have supporting the reasons for its exclusion and what is the outcome. So I would just say it's a case-by-case basis, but certainly not something to be undercounted. And if you are concerned, if you were a teacher or a parent and concerned about classroom censorship, you can certainly reach out to the ACLU. I know the New York Civil Liberties Union, NYCLU, is looking into this, and you can reach out to schools at nyclu.org. They are also, and and if we had more time, I I know you look at other issues, things like um, poverty, things like policing. I want to have you back on the program for a discussion about those. But if we're talking specifically during this installment about schools, you've mentioned that NICLU, the New York Civil Liberties Union, the local affiliate, as it were, has got a, um, a town hall meeting of sorts coming up later in September. Tell me about that before we go. NICLU is working with around 30 advocacy groups to put together a town hall. It's titled Our Children Have Rights. The town hall will be in Buffalo on September 29th. And it's really focusing on issues that are arising in Buffalo public schools, particularly with regards to suspension, special education, and language access issues. If you are a parent who has faced these issues or your student has faced these issues or also a teacher who is worried about these issues, please reach out to schools at NYCLU, nyclu.org, or you can call 212-607-3300. These organizations are looking into this issue because we know it has a racially disproportionate effect. A 2016 to 2017 report found that black boys in Buffalo had the highest rate of student suspensions in the state. And so many organizations are looking into these issues. And for parents of students, it would be wonderful for them to hear from you. That's the uh, what's often called the school to prison pipeline. The idea that exactly that um, black boys, especially according to the statistics, Uh, face more severe discipline, which starts a spiral, which possibly suspends them from school and gets them involved in crime and uh, school-to-prison pipeline. Yes. Now, you also mentioned language access. Explain what that looks like for me. Yeah, that's a great question. Schools in New York, we have the value of having a multi-ethnic society and wanting to make sure that students are able to learn and that there is part of our broader campaign that students are able to learn. So if your student has speaks a language other than English and has had difficulty um, receiving instruction that as they're learning English, that is an issue that we would want to look into further as well. We want to ensure that kids are in school and that they're able to learn. I don't want to get ahead of this uh, town hall meeting, but I assume the outreach is underway because you folks imagine such cases already exist. Is there any way before you gather all of the data to at least um, quantify the problem? How often do you see this sort of stuff? Well, I think these efforts are normally undertaken when we start to receive outreach, consistent issues. We see people reaching out to us with the same issues or different iterations of the same issues. So taking a broader approach. I'm not aware of research efforts ongoing at this time to quantify, but that that might be occurring as well. It happens enough that you say, hey, let's let's hold a town hall and look and see what it looks like. Yes. All right. Leah, thanks so very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Leah Watson is a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union. Again, she spoke of that town hall meeting coming up on September 29th. If you'd like to share stories about school suspension, irregularities, or language access issues, that email again, nyclu.org, 
or that phone number again, 212-607-3300, 212-607-3300. This is Buffalo What's Next, our weekday daily discussion that springs from the top shootings. This week focusing mainly on education, among other things. We'll be back tomorrow on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown. I'm Dave Debo. Thanks for listening.